Many of us have been exchanging since 2016, uh, 17, or more recently, uh, in workshops, for example, in Santiago, uh, Rio de Janeiro, other workshops took place in New York. And we are the kind of new generation that rereads the text from the 60s and the 70s by Hoover Fichte. And uh, I would like to pick up the question that Am Amilcar posed in, in the project of uh, Brazil, that he's one of the curators together with uh, uh, Max Jorge Hinderer Cruz, that instead of only interpreting uh, the text by Hoover Fichte that he wrote, one of the texts he wrote uh, during his journey in Brazil, Explosion, he also wrote uh, other books, Shango, for example, during his trips in Salvador de Bahia, Trinidad, and Haiti, or uh, the house uh, in Luis de Maranhão, also in uh, Brazil. Uh, Explosion is not only a journey in, um, in Salvador and Rio de Janeiro, but before, he stopped in Buenos Aires, where he interviewed very shortly Jorge Luis Borges. They had kind of surrealist conversation where uh, um, Borges took the word and uh, interviewed Fichte, uh, so took the control of the conversation. And then in Chile, uh, in 1971, uh, he was six weeks uh, attempting to interview the first socialist uh, president, Salvador Allende, until he managed. But during the six weeks, he also uh, wrote a radio program, and he went through the uh, underground uh, gay uh, and homosexual uh, culture through the saunas, um, porno cinemas, and uh, also described with uh, great interest the political murals that he continued to follow. You will see in the exhibition in Senegal, the murals by Pisto Boy. So in these re-readings, we have been also, me as a researcher in Hakave of this project, with the collaborators, curators, artists, uh, activists, uh, educators, uh, have been following also transversal questions. And one of these uh, major uh, transversal uh, interests uh, by Fichte was in the Afro-diasporic religions. As you watch in the film, Fichte is permanently uh, hybridizing the language with these notes, very ethnographic notes that he described, but also very literary. And he also um, wrote many texts for, uh, for journals, for newspapers. So many times you could see the same scene in a, in a novel and uh, as an interview in a newspaper. The panel that uh, reunites us today is an, a specific take on, on the Afro-diasporic religions in the Candomblé religion. And specifically, we will try to dive and, and, and talk on the experience of trans. As I, I wanted to anticipate, as Almirkal pose, not only to interpret uh, uh, the text by Fichte, but to cross, to traverse him in a way that we activate in our generation re-readings from the localities and from the actors that are the protagonists of this topic, are not the subjects of a, of a discourse, but are subjects by themselves. The panel, we entitled it Breaking the Consciousness, the Politics of Trans, and it's very interesting how Fichte, at the beginning of his journeys, he analyzed the rituals of Candomblé from a Marxistic perspective. So we have to uh, somehow perceive this toolbox. And for him, at the beginning, was a, a religious practice that con conduced to escapism, to alienation, would be like the opium uh, of the people, and will prevent them to be really politically active. But after some years, he changed his uh, interpretation, and he recognized the scandomble and the Afro-diasporic uh, religion and, and practice were, in fact, a, 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 state, a statement of uh, resistance, of cultural resistance. So we have already two lens uh, to enter in, in the same experience. And, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, to my left, Nina Graf is an anthropologist and a musicologist. She had done the opposite journey of Fichte, is Brazilian and have uh, researched the candomblé practice from the mimesis. It's no written instruction how to learn the candomblé, so Nina will introduce how you learn it through 
a body a language and, and, and embodied knowledge. And I would like also to say hello to Mura Suarez from the Forum Brazil, the House of Candomblé that Nina will introduce, that is uh, with us. Bravo. And I hope we all participate afterwards in the conversation. Nina will introduce her research in a short video on, on, on this house and tell us on the mimesis until the uh, specific uh, uh, practice uh, of trans. Uh, Amilcar will continue. He's the curator uh, together, as I said, with uh, Max Jorge Hinderer Cruz of the project in Brazil. And many of the works are also here in the exhibition. Uh, then we will follow with Ayrson Heraclito, uh, his member and practitioner of Candomblé, artist, professor, curator, and uh, he will also invite us to see these uh, divisions and to discuss the divisions between what is modern or contemporary art and the ritualistic practices of, of Candomblé. Many of the discussions that these books of Fichte trigger had allowed us to reconstruct these power structures, the divisions, in order to try also to blur them uh, uh, and to challenge them and to somehow have all together in different ways a transformative experience. And finally, I'm also very happy to, to know in these last days, Tiona uh, is an artist and curator. She has uh, two works in the exhibition, two uh, video pieces that you see at the end of the space. And she will uh, talk today uh, about other piece that is not uh, in the exhibition. I was praying to the wrong God, right? Um, that she presented recently in uh, in United States. And also uh, it's an opportunity also to discuss how uh, Tiona is uh, dealing with the divisions between her practice as an artist and initiated in Santeria in Cuba in this case. So I welcome Nina and uh, all the panel, Ayrson, Tiona, and Amikar. Thank you, Paz, for the introduction, and especially for the invitation of being here, <clears throat> and for giving me a voice for being here, which I will use. Yeah, oh, mini boom. Ia o mini bum do orixá orerê. Ia o mini bum do miro orixá orerê. Ia o mini bum do miro orixá orerê. I sing this song to offer you and to resonate with you uh, through a bodily experience coming from Candomblé. My voice has reached your ears, has touched your skin, vibrated with your skin, and my face has revealed the sincerity um, of my offering to your eyes. You don't know the literal meanings of this song, and neither do I. You don't know what it represents, but you might guess how meaningful it is to me. No literal translation can reveal this meaning. The secret behind this song is not contained in its representations, but in the experiences that I and many others share together within Candomblé. Our sacred secret is hidden in our bodies and in the rituals that collectively reenact a part of this secret by means of songs, dances, food, offerings, flowers and herbs, among many others. African slaves could not bring I will read my text. African slaves could not bring to Brazil any material goods with them, but only the experience, knowledge, and wisdom carried in their bodies. This cannot be taken away. They cannot be stolen, erased, destroyed, not even after death, because it is a wisdom collectively shared. Today I want to present you how Candomblé works not as a mere practice of political resistance, but as a spiritual path that by reconnecting individual selves to the world, 
empowers people from different backgrounds, much beyond linguistic, cultural, and political categories. Similar to Hubert Fichte, for my PhD research, I turned my own body into a source, a privileged source of investigation and creation. Not by dissecting it or classifying somatic stimuli, stimuli as an object, but by discovering, unveiling it as a subject, which is the material ground of my existence, of our existence. Practicing candomblé as members do would provide me with insight into their subjectivities and processes of bodily learning, as opposed to intellectual learning through books and other media. As an anthropologist of music, at the beginning I thought that I would learn candomblé songs and dances, that I would memorize lyrics, melodies, gestures, and footsteps. However, the apprenticeship embraced much more than acquiring specific mechanical techniques. Mimetic learning or learning through imitation is mostly an unconscious undertaking that strives to the appropriation of the other and transformation through the other and the world. So I did not only learn techniques, but I embodied the experiences, meanings, and values that such techniques reenact. My apprenticeship, which should have lasted only six months of fieldwork, has lasted six years so far. I have embodied the tradition and became a member of the Soul Temple for the Practice of Candomblé in Germany, Ileo Basileke, located here in Kreuzberg, inside the Intercultural Center Forum Brazil. As Hubert Fichte has traveled from Germany to Brazil, integrating himself as an outsider into Candomblé, so has Candomblé traveled to Germany in 2008, officially, integrating its rituals into a highly contrasting geography and culture. Let me present to you the, the Candomblé house here in Berlin through a video made by channel ZDF in the occasion of the World Cup of 2014. Wir sind beim Forum Brasil, das einen umfassenden Einblick in die Traditionen des brasilianischen Nordostens gewährt. Ein sehr wichtiger Teil der Kultur Bahias ist der Candomblé. Diese Religion verbindet die Kultur und den Glauben vieler afrikanischer Stämme, die als Sklaven nach Brasilien kamen. Der Candomblé gehört bis heute zum Alltag in Bahia. Aus Afrika stammt die Religion der Orisha. Orisha ist ein Gott, eine Kraft der Natur. Und jede Gegend gehört zu einem anderen Orisha. Oyo zu Shango, Alada zu Oshum. Und als Afrikaner als Sklaven nach Brasilien kamen, die in Sklavenvierteln lebten, gab es diese regionalen Trennungen nicht mehr. Sie mussten die Kräfte, die Weisheit aller Götter vereinen, um die religiösen Riten an einem Ort auszuüben. Und so entstand der Grand Romble. Mura ist ein Babalorisha, ein spiritueller Führer. Für die Gemeinschaft befragt er das Orakel und verteilt die Aufgaben, die ihm von den Orishas aufgetragen werden. Er kennt die Pflanzen und ihre Kräfte genau. Er lebt in Berlin, denn inzwischen gibt es auch hier Menschen, die sich dem Candomblé angeschlossen haben und gemeinsam seine Rituale praktizieren. Die Glaubensgemeinschaft versteht sich als Familie, in der jeder seine Rolle und seine Verantwortung hat. Jeder kann dem Candomblé beitreten. Aber er ist eine sehr differenzierte Religion. Die Hierarchie ist komplex und Disziplin ist im Candomblé sehr wichtig. Der Respekt vor dem Orisha und vor den Menschen ist sehr stark ausgeprägt. Manche verstehen das falsch, da es im Candomblé viele Farben, Tanz, Musik und Essen gibt. Und viele glauben, dass es nur eine große Party ist. Aber es ist nicht nur eine Party. Es ist eine Religion. Wenn sie dann das wirkliche Candomblé kennenlernen, die Schwierigkeiten, es im Alltag zu leben, dann distanzieren sich die Menschen wieder. Das Wichtigste beim Candomblé ist die Verbundenheit mit der Natur. Viele Riten beziehen die Natur direkt mit ein. Wie kann eine solche Religion in einem Land wie Deutschland überhaupt praktiziert werden, wo Klima und Flora jedoch ganz anders sind? 
Deutschland ist ganz anders. Es ist kein tropisches Land, hat nichts mit Afrika zu tun und auch nichts mit Brasilien. Deswegen gibt es vieles, das wir anders machen müssen. Oder wie man auf Deutsch sagt, wir müssen uns anpassen, vor allem an die Kälte. Candomblé stammt aus einem tropischen Land. Und was brauchen wir? Wir brauchen Blätter und daraus die Bäder, die Medikamente, die Tees und das Essen zu machen. Also müssen wir unsere Pflanzen in Töpfe setzen und uns mehr als in Brasilien um sie kümmern. Dort werfen wir die Samen in die Erde und sie wachsen von alleine. So, Mugura, who is present with us here, just explained to us that the Orishas are forces of nature. In Bahia, Orishas are everywhere. Yemanja does not only represent, she is the force of the sea. Oshasi is the hunter, god of the woods and the fauna. Osain is the force of flora, of herbs and the curve through uh, sacred herbs. Yansan is the force of the wind and storm. Each Orisha is assigned with a color, favorite food, and specific herbs from their habitats, favorite uh, rhythms, and dance steps. And if Orishas are forces of nature, so are they forces within us as part of nature. Each person is assigned with one Orisha since birth, carrying its personality traits. Orishas' people are reserved and strategic like hunters. Yansas are unpredictable and temperamental as the wind and storm. Yemanjas are overwhelmingly sensitive as the sea. So, if in Bahia Orishas are omnipresent, what happens in Germany? The Orishas hibernate. <laughs> well, they might not hibernate, but they, they are certainly not as intensively percep perceptible as in tropical countries. Nevertheless, at Ileo Basileke, People from different cultures and even beliefs can sense and learn to sense the, the force of the Orishas more intensively at rituals. Joaquin La Habana, the uh, Santeria priest wearing yellow in the picture, uh, as well as German Catholics or Protestants and even Israeli Jews, all of them come together to feel and praise the energy of the Orishas. There, everyone except for the elders are barefoot in order to be literally in touch with the energy of the Orishas arising from Earth. German sociologist Hartmut Rosa argues that in modern society we build more and more disengaged relationships to the world and consequently to others and to ourselves. He gives the example of touch and skin, our first and immediate interface with the world. Being barefoot connects us directly with the Earth, whereas by means of shoes, we create a highly effective buffering distance to flesh and world, which enables us to shift from a participatory to an objective and objectifying world relationship. So we get used to feel our feet and body as set apart from the world, disconnecting more and more from them, from our own body. I come to perceive the world and my body as mute object objects, as foreigners, as enemies that threat me. But the world did not become mute. I have lost what Rosa calls the vibrating wire that enables resonance, a vibrating wire that enables a resonant way of being in the world. So I was the one who could not listen nor hear the world nor myself until Candomblé shifted my perception, or more specifically, Oshun. The goddess of rivers and waterfalls, of sweet water and sweetness, of richness and gold, the reason of her yellow color, the goddess of sensibility and art, Oshun is the Orisha of love and of beauty. Now it became obvious who is my Orisha. <laughs> well, but it was not obvious to me. The relationship to the Orishas, to spirituality, as well as to others, to nature and to oneself, requires much exercise, an exercise of the body. The practice of candomblé is not simply an activity accomplished in a few hours a week, but it's an intense bodily experience of constant transformation. Within a candomblé house, members learn to establish and cultivate a relationship to the orishas that engages all the senses. One greets the orisha with the whole body on the floor, one cleanses the ambient through fumigation, showers oneself with sacred herbs, 
cooks for the Orishas, speaks out loud with them, drums, sings, and dances for the gods. Candomblé is a mirror of life. Everyday tasks are ritualized, and life is mirrored by the rituals. As explained in the video, the Candomblé community is experienced as a family, in which each person has its own role and responsibility, taking care of each other. More than that, this family is configured by different forces, by strategic Oshosis, unpredictable Yansas, and the most beautiful Oshuns. <laughs> the other works as a mirror of the self, on which one recognizes different Orishas' qualities and accepts one's own quality and personality traits instead of repressing them. For each Orisha and person have a place of their own in the world. German member Aman Kwadishango expressed, it was the first time in my life that I didn't attract anyone's attention, that I was not remarkable. That's a great feeling I never had before. I was always the black one. For the first time in Germany, a German could find a place to be himself. When we reestablish the contact of to the body and to the world, we also find ourselves for, if I perceive the world with my own body, the body is my natural self and the subject of my perception. As German member Isa said, true candomblé one gets to feel closer to oneself. While the perception of the world and one's, of one's own body gradually expands in this process, one learns to sense the power of the Orishas in the environment as well as within oneself. As Verge put it, Candomblé is a religion exalting the personality, where one can be truly him or herself and not as the society would like one to be. For those who have something to express through the unconscious, the trance allows it to manifest itself. The power of the Orisha is inside all of us, and in Candomblé it may manifest itself in trance states. Our body is no longer controlled by our consciousness, but by the Orishas who come to Earth to celebrate with humans. This is, this is Oshun on Earth. To decide whether to believe that spirits exist and possess human bodies, or whether to consider it simply as an altered state of mind, is secondary, if ever relevant. The category, the representation, the form, or interpretative framework one chooses for referring to this experience does not change its transcendental power, the power of transforming people's lives. To talk about spirituality and transcendence in a challenge is a challenge, especially within modern discourses pervaded by what Latour calls the belief in pure and exact knowledge. I have unsuccessfully researched for scientific evidence for the strong, vivid, crucial experiences of Candomblé members in order to convince audiences about their realness or rationality. Although love cannot be explained nor proved, no one takes it for unreal, for it is real for everyone. The difference between love and spirituality is that the first, love, is not stigmatized as primitive, anomalous, or irrational, only as a cliché. Hubert Fichte was very skeptical and yet fascinated by Candomblé, just as I was. I doubted that the experience could exist. At the same time, I feared very deeply that they could exist, which means that very deeply I believed in the, in the possibility that they could exist. Sharing experiences and stories with candomblé practitioners was, who seemed very reasonable and rational would gradually put my own skepticism in doubt. They would tell me they used the, to experience nothing extraordinary just like me until they stopped being too rational and fearing the loss of self-control. As the Fono João de Xangô put it, I think there's a rationalization block. It was very liberating to me when I learned to stop having fear. People seek rules, they seek certitude. People seek security, reasoning. What do they seek? A plus B, you know, like a recipe. I have liberated myself the moment I learned that it doesn't work like this. There will be no recipe. There's like two days like this, and after half an hour, it's something else. There's intuition, there's situatedness. You deal with things that are not rational. Rationality is by definition reasoning. 
and as such is present in, is present in most beliefs in spirits. Thus it's not a matter of being a rational or irrational person, an emotional or intuitive person. The rationalization block arises not so much in geographic context, but in a Cartesian society. Cartesian doubt is skepticism. It is critical judgment as methodology. However, the act of doubting itself establishes the possibility of certitude. Skepticism implies the illusion of certitude, security, and control. But Candomblé has no dogma. There is no, nothing certain, fixed, not predetermined in Candomblé by humans. Instead, spirits constantly determine the destiny, negotiating its terms with humans through the oracle and diverse kinds of rituals. When reasoning with skeptical doubt, we objectify, choose, classify, and hence we judge experiences, people and things as separate from us, disengaging from them. But to recognize the embodiedness of our being in the world is to discover a common ground where self and other are one. I have not only realized but experienced the truth of this statement the moment that the rational control over my body was suspended during a ritual. I transcended my material boundaries, feeling that others' energy and mine were simply the same. At that moment, I didn't lose my consciousness. I rather gained the awareness that my existence reaches much beyond what I can consciously experience and rationally explain. The only thing I lost that I got rid of was the illusion that I can control it. When we open ourselves towards other ways of knowing, of perceiving and conveying the world, we face reality the way it is and not the way we believe it to be, and we transcend it. Therein lies true freedom and power. We don't lose ourselves, we love ourselves, we conquer ourselves as mingle within an infinite world. To conclude, Representations express, that is, they press outwards, uh, facets of an essence. The power of Candomblé does not lie in its diverse and complex, amazing representations, but rather in the manifestation of it, its essence, which allows and fosters an infinitude of forms and ways of life, empowering members as well as sympathizers. This very essence is the secret, it is the sacred of Candomblé which time refused to hide in a transcendental place, not distant from ourselves, in our own body, as part of the world we inhabit. Thank you for your resonance.
The piece that you just heard is a song from the record of Brazilian artist Negro Leo from San Luis do Maranhão. The record was produced in the context of the project that we did in, in Brazil. The name of the record is Coisado. Coisado would mean something like being resumed to the condition of a thing or dinge in, in German. No? And uh, the song that the piece that you that you just heard is called Deu Ruim, which means things went bad or uh, it went wrong, something like this. No? And part of it is, is made by samples that Negro Leo and Max Jorge Hindere Cruz, the, the co-curator of the Brazilian uh, uh, session of the project, they recorded uh, during the ceremony of Lava Boys in São José do Ribamar and Tambor de Crioula <coughs> do Largo de Santo Antonio at São Luís do Maranhão. Uh, we have only supposedly 15 minutes, and uh, I could spend my 15 minutes easily greeting and thanking everyone that has been part of the project. No? But uh, I'm gonna just thank some of the people. Uh, you, of course, which are with me. It has been a pleasure to meet some of the colleagues uh, that were part of the other stations. But I would like to really thank uh, especially Michele Machuzzi, Ayrson Heraclito, Ana Letícia Barreto, Adriana Schneider, Thiago Rosa, Patrick Sonata, Carla Suarez, Marcelo Magano, Livia Lazo, Lucas Oradovski, Cynthia Guedes, Negro Léo, Antone Jabi from Pan African Space Station, Rodrigo Bueno, bueno Coletivo Bonobando, which is some of the people that I name are from Coletivo Bonobando. Indianari Siqueira, Diran Castro, Vanessa Oliveira, Coletivo Problema, Chapulin, J. Mombasa, Mateusa, Diego Ribeiro, Luisa Hartmann e Max Jorge Hinderer Cruz. Uh, I'm not a specialist in trends, I'm not initiated, and I'm, I'm not part of the people of Saint. And what I would like to do here with you, it's, it's a pity that I, I cannot see your faces because I, I always think it's really bad not looking into the eyes of the people with what that you are talking with. I don't know if it's possible to change the light in the, in the public. But anyway, I'm taking this idea of, of trends to think about translation, which was the main thing that you, we, we, we used to think about how to approach the idea of, of doing a project connected to Fichte in the context of Brazil. You know? So also because I believe that some things are untranslatable, like trends. You know? <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, I would like to start, maybe it's an easy way, about the title of the panel, which is Breaking the Consciousness, Politics of Trends. And the idea for me, when I read this idea of breaking consciousness, I started thinking that to think about breaking consciousness, there's something which imp it, it's implied, you know, it's biased. First, that there is something that is actually consciousness, I mean, that something that we can define and precise, so we believe that consciousness exists and exists as such. And then that this something that we call consciousness has a unity, is coherent, and then it's individual. And therefore, we can also walk maybe in a fast way and think that it's also separated from the rest of the world. Something that maybe we can name as the interiority or the autonomous subject, the white bourgeois subjectivity, or simply name it subjectivity. No, when we know that maybe if there's something that we may refer with a lot of brackets and by the full consciousness, it is always something fragmented, constitutively incomplete, inconsistent, collective, multiple, diverse. In this sense, then I would risk to say here that um, what we, in a, an operation of generalization, call as the states of trends, you know, we take a lot of things and call them trends, <clears throat> it's not about breaking consciousness, but to conjure that subjectivity understood as interiority, as the autonomous subject, will not be sedimented, will not govern, will not be stated in the sense of become the state. You know? So, uh, in the introduction of the book <coughs> of 1990, uh, A Critique of Postcolonial Reason Towards a History of the Vanishing Present, I like because it's a long title. Uh, Gayatri Spivak states, 
It may be interesting to read Kant, Hegel, Marx as remote, remote discursive precursors rather than as transparent or motivated repositories of ideas. I keep hoping that some readers may then discover a constructive rather than disabling complicity between our own positions and theirs, for there often seems no choice between excuses and accusations, the muddy stream and the mud slinging. And yet, 20 years later of the book, the present and the future seem to have vanished and we also seem to be here in the position of attempting to produce a constructive complicity with one more German. No? Noch einmal, no? <clears throat> so, but at the same time, following this, this advice, so to say, of Spivak, the way that it, I, and I, I can say also Max and, and, and also the artists, that we've been trying to approach the project and also Fichte in the last six years maybe, because that's when I started talking with Didrich about Fichte, is neither by excusing him, but also not from a position of being accusing him. No? So in the case of Brazil, enabling the book Explosion uh, to become Explosão was not something, was not some operation that was resumed to a translation of versing from one language to another. It was actually to transport from one world to another world, where the former matter of Fichte's writing becomes its readers. And then the process of translation becomes a process of transformation. And then a lot of things start to emerge that probably for a German public reader would not be so, would be maybe invisible. No? That would be what I, I would call here as uh, 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 the, the colonial choreographies that Fichte followed in his methodologies, in his trips, somewhere in his writings uh, that appear in the text and also in his desires. <clears throat> Ayuton Krenak uh, um, says that what we call the Western world or whiteness is always in the will of consuming other subjectivities. And uh, I cannot think that Fichte was not also doing something similar. No? So how in this process of translation, of transferring, of bringing something from one world to another world that Fichte was not able to understand, as Paz was saying, for instance, that he was looking at Candomblé in the beginning with a kind of Marxist glass and only seeing what he already knew, no? So he didn't even knew, needed to go to Brazil to write this. <clears throat> um, how to do this process, no? And for us it was, very, rare, very relevant to understand that there were uh, uh, several operations that we needed to do, and that we did to do collectively, to enter in some kind of states of translation, you know, and do it, it collectively to see what will emerge, and use Fichte as a possibility to engage very, very, very relevant and serious issues in Brazil by decentralizing him. So our idea was never to respond to Fichte, but more so to say to respond to the project of bringing Fichte. No? And that was mainly what we did with Max, uh, inviting this group of amazing, not only artists, but people uh, that helped us a lot to kind of produce um, in one side, uh, what I will call a critical context to the reception of the book, which is Exposal, no? the, the translation, but also to produce some amazing uh, and very complex art pieces. Yeah. Uh, I think it's fundamental, just to bring some, some ideas, because my idea is much more bring things for us maybe to enter in a conversation, 
is to emphasize that trends doesn't exist with the, without the bodies, without the people, without the ways and lifestyles, without the world where trends is possible and makes sense, produces meaning, is part of a world. So how to talk about trends and politics when the same people and worlds where trends is possible are under constant threat, in the case of Brazil, imprisoned, violated, murdered by the state and whiteness, or the white world, and to continue uh, uh, the whole extractive world of economies that has been benefiting the North, and that also produce a, a specific position for Fichte, even at that time. Yesterday, uh, I don't know if it, probably some of you were here, was raised the question of what if Fichte had never left, had stayed in the countries that he visited. For me, it's more, much, much more the question if Fichte would, if Fichte is still possible today. Would an operation like the one that Fichte was doing 40, 50 years ago be possible today? In the case of one of the first texts that Fichte wrote about Brazil, which is an article that appeared by the end of the 60s on Der Spiegel, we could almost copy paste it to the Brazilian reality today. And you will see how astonishing, terrible the resemblance of the description of Fichte of that time fit with the reality of today. Um, just to continue bringing some things that I was thinking about, again, about titles, uh, I think that we haven't yet discussed yesterday in the panel and today about the whole title of the project, Hubert Fichte, Love and Ethnology. And I, I really wonder, and I ask myself, and I, I, I ask you too, and us, is it really possible to put love and ethnology together? Wouldn't be that an oxymoron? No. Is it possible if you think of the ethnology as a science that has been continuously othering the other? No. So is it possible love and ethnology together? How these two what does these two words produce together? And I would like to read just in the catalog, there's a beautiful piece of Denise Ferreira da Silva. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna spoil, I'm gonna read the last sentence of the text. <laughs> Which is, so Hubert Fichte, who was he? A German gay man who traveled to Africa, the Americas and the Caribbean, in search of specimens of African culture, the stuff of an African aesthetic. While he did so, his desire left traces which are available to fractal readings, to readings that seek to expose the effects of the authority presupposed in the transparent positions equated with white slash European identity. Can you put the other side?
This, this last track has the, the, the title of it is the same name of the, of the album, which is Coesado, again, to be resumed to the condition of a, a thing. Thank you. Boa tarde a todos. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the invitation for me to be here, part of this project, such an important project, which was developed along so many years, three years. And I would like to thank very much for having been invited by the curators, and that enabled me to get to know uh, Fichte's work better. Well, to know, actually, because I didn't know it. I was born in Bahia, in Brazil. I lived in Salvador for a good many years of my life. I'm still living there. And I had no kind of information about Fichte's presence in Salvador, so this was quite important to me. It was an inaugural moment for me, this project. I would like to thank all the Afro-Brazilian gods that bring me here, the Voduns. I'm from the nation from Benin, which has uh, a lot of resonance in Bahia and the religious houses of Jeji. So I would like to greet all of them first, to greet the uh, people of the saints. I don't think uh, HKV has ever had so many people in white bringing so much light with their positive energies into this house. And first and foremost, I would like to use the word here either in Tupi Guarani or in Fon or Yoruba languages, but I think we are not that far yet. But I think that the project, the human project of this humanity that's gathered here is this, and it's about that which I would like to start talking um, from this perspective that I would like to mention a little bit, the theme today. I've been introduced, I've been 35 years in Candomblé, and 35 years as an artist. So when I was at the university studying art history, from a very Western, very European perspective, I was studying Impressionism, the avant-garde, the historical European avant-garde, Cubism, Fauvism. I was also initiating, I was being initiated into this world which is so alive in my city in Cachoeira. It's close to Salvador in Bahia which is this world which survives and has survived coming from pre-colonial Africa, an Africa which existed and still exists and survives and reinvents itself. In this America, which hosted it so violently, so violently, all these African peoples. So my education and my concept of art and life go through this sort of knowledge, which is not just religious knowledge. Candomblé is not just religion. Candomblé is a philosophy and it's a science, especially. And it's a science which is very different from Western science, from European sciences. And I think that it was in following that path which shed light into the intuition of Fichte so that he uh, dared enter these paths 
as far as trans is concerned, we can't really talk about trans. We speaking from the inside, but we can comment on it. Trans. I think the European experience that's closest to trans is ecstasy. Within the Catholic religion, several saints had a contact. They were traversed by the divine, and they had to elaborate a poetic text. I always think about that when I think about Fichte, trying to create a bridge between anthropology and poetry. I always think about ecstasy of St. Teresa of Avila. I think of the ecstasy of St. Francis. It's as if Fichte had a desire of touching the divine and deconstruct the divine. So trance, of which I talk about here, is ecstasy. It's Afro-Brazilian ecstasy. It is a form of communication between worlds that we have to learn to understand and to live with. Within the science and this religion and this philosophy that is at the base of religions which are non-Western, especially Afro-Brazilian religions and Afro-Indigenous, it's all this potential for knowledge that we have to access. And one of the most fundamental issues which I think are at the core is the relationship that we establish with nature. Nature is seen not from a scientific, biological point of view. Nature has energies which we need to access. And I think about Berlin, a city with such a complex history of destruction and conflict and tensions, and at the same time survives full of parks and rivers with clear waters. That has a power that I think we have to access. Part of my function as Ogan, as a priest, of a terreiro, as a house of Axé, also, as an artist, professor, and curator, is to try and to disseminate this kind of knowledge and information. You have no idea of the power you have with nature. It's important to understand, to talk to water, talk to the waters, to listen to the voice of the leaves from the trees, to talk to the wind, to the fire, to connect and converse with nature. This kind of knowledge survives in some regions in Africa, in some regions in the East, in many regions in the Americas especially the black indigenous Americas. Well, something else I'd like to mention. There is a big difference between candomblé and these uh, consciousness-altering experiences, which we can call trance, with the experience of shamans, shamanism. It is also uh, an awareness raising and a, a consciousness changing experience. But in Candomblé, I'm not speaking in absolutes here, but just from my point of view and my knowledge, is that in Candomblé, what happens is that the divinity is within the initiate. So it comes to the surface when it is prepared, when the divinity is prepared, it comes to the surface. 
it doesn't enter the body. It expands from within the body. It extends the body. And shows itself through the body of the initiate. In shamanism, the states of consciousness, which are most common, is the contact, contact that the shaman has with the gods, with the divinity. He or she is a listener. He or she listens and converses. So it's just a matter of communication. The shaman is a messenger. That's a very important uh, distinction so that we don't confuse things, mix them up. I invited a brother in Saint, Irmão de Santo of mine, from the divinity of the forest, or Saint, for him to write an ecstasy for me because Last year, I was invited to, to create a room, well, for an exhibition here in Germany, in Stuttgart, a room on candomblé in an exhibition that was about ecstasy in the Kunstmuseum in Stuttgart. And I invited this brother of mine who has contact with trance and who lives the experience of trance. Because in Candomblé, the Yogans, like myself and the Ekejis, do not incorporate, there is no trance involved. Only Voduns have the trance, the people that receive the trance, so to speak. I do not incorporate the gods. So I invited a brother of mine to talk a little bit about the experience of trance in the form of poetry. And I created, in the end, a film, a short film, a five-minute film, which I think says a lot about trance and says things in a very respectful way, which I think is the most important thing, is also to establish a relationship of respect with all cultures in the world. I think this house also comes here to celebrate that respect. So against extractivism, against prejudices, against all the cliches, the reductionisms, let's celebrate respect and listen a bit all the voices that may echo. There are no voices which are more important than others. All voices are important and should echo. So I'd like to show the film. I don't know if it's here or where, but yeah, is it here? Os iniciados no candomblé da Bahia, conhecidos como povo de santo, empregam costumeiramente a expressão dar o santo para significar o transe místico, momento em que a divindade para a qual cada pessoa foi consagrada se manifesta. Quando da iniciação por meio de um conjunto complexo de rito, o santo Orixá Vodum, a quem o neófito pertence, é unido à sua cabeça Ori, tornando-se uno com ela. Embora ainda haja Orixá Vodum de um lado, iniciado de outro, falar do Ori a partir da iniciação implica falar por necessidade do santo. O transe o dar o santo significa, sobretudo, dá-lo à vista dos que, 
não o tendo na cabeça, só o apreendem por meio da sua manifestação no habitáculo sagrado, que é o corpo de seu iniciado. Dar o santo é também dar-se ao santo, é esquecer-se de si, é entregar-se àquele que guia nossos passos, que nos protege, que nos propicia a abundância, que nos multiplica os dias. O habitáculo do santo, o corpo de seu iniciado, é o templo mais sagrado que se pode conceber. Porque o axé, a força viva do cosmo, da natureza, impregna o sangue de sua argamassa e os tijolos de seus ossos. O orixá Vodum, quando se mostra no transe, não toma posse de nada, porque não pode tomar posse do que já é seu. O transe é sempre experiência personalíssima de que não se pode falar. Se disséssemos que Deus nos falou, seria possível pensar em glosar esta fala, em amplificá-la por meio de um sem número de procedimentos discursivos que visasse a torná-la mais inteligível e a extrair dela toda a sua oculta significação. A linguagem pode ser sempre matéria de interpretação. Quanto ao transe, se se insiste em falar dele, o único modo viável para mim, a Gessi, sacerdote do culto às folhas da casa Oyatundê, o babalorixá Júlio Santana Braga, é por meio da metáfora. Ague mare logo gaia cusoda. Ague mare, ague mare, gaia cusoda. Ague mare, ague mare logo gaia cusoda. Ague mare, ague mare, gaia cusoda. Ague mare. Quando dou a o Vodum Floresta, o Sain, no Candomblé Nagô, sei que é leve carregar a floresta na cabeça, que as árvores contam segredos com suas línguas verdes, que meu santo fica em pé sobre uma única perna e que jamais tropeça ou cai, tanto em sua casa, na floresta, quanto na casa de santo que suas línguas são também sua coma, que ora enfeita com flor, ora com fruto, para nos ensinar o que são primavera e outono. Quando a guerra dança, saudamos-nos na Bahia, exclamando, eu e, eu e, ó as folhas, porque o povo de santo sabe, sem que ninguém tenha de lhe dizer, que todos os toros de uma floresta são pernas, que todas as comas de árvores são cabeças e que são as folhas, todas a língua que soltam seu ilá ou o som divino para nos saudar. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Tiana Nakia McLaughlin. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanna uh, say before I kind of go into this because I have a lot of slides. Um, because this is one of the, you know, I think the first chances that many of you are hearing me speak or have a maybe encounter with my work. So <clears throat> in coming and taking part in this uh, overall project, I, I come from the New York stop the New York iteration um, where um, Huber Fichte's uh, uh, The Black City is translated. And 
And this comes into my sphere of conscious last year. So I had no idea of who he was prior to that. Um, so I don't, you know, I, will, I think I would like to make clear a couple of things is that um, the life and the, the, the ideas that I have are in progress prior to him. My work, even though it's kind of considered a, a, a bit of a commission, is not made in response or to try to, um, I think, really counter too much of anything. Uh, my practice in general is one where I um, tend to create work for myself first, and then I invite others to look if they, so, if they care to, right? Um, and in the form of entering, you know, coming from film and entering into a visual arts practice, it's become a little bit more complicated in that invitation of looking, you know? So I would say that the works that I have in this, uh, the culmination of this like multi-year project is something that sits beside FICTA, not something that is to be in encapsulated within. Um, there's a lot of critiques. My entrance into this project is one that is highly critical. Um, one that really wants to make explicit uh, something that I haven't yet really heard made explicit around um, Ficta's engagement in sexual tourism as while well. he also uh, engaged in this ethnogra ethnographic uh, study or search or writing. Um, I'm gonna speak here today as a person who's born in the South, I'm from South Carolina, born in Blyville, Arkansas. I'm a black queer woman. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a priestess of Ogun, initiated in Havana, Cuba, seven years ago, and I'm seven years old now. The three works that I'm gonna to present to you, two uh, which are on view in this project, and one that is uh, part of this year-long work that I've dedicated to Shango, I wanna just give you all a little bit of context about it, okay? All right, so this is a um, kind of a, remix of all the lectures that I've been doing, um, and I wanted to start off with this uh, title, which is a excerpt from a poem from Brad Johnson, who is whose work is featured, or I make the work for him, the Labyrinth 1.0 that's featured in the back, that's the black and white piece. Um, the poetics of beauty will inevitably resort to the most base pleadings and other wiles in order to secure its release. So um, the brief, very fast 30 second thing is that I am a uh, filmmaker, visual artist, um, moving into this like weird installation practice. Um, my work really centers around thinking about artifact, socio effect, mint effect. I choose to enter, in that, enter into those points because I'm very much thinking about the larger way that my, my work will be processed, much in the ways that I'm seeing Ficta's uh, work be processed here. I'm gonna start with the Labyrinth 1.0, which is focusing on a subject uh, by the name of Brad Johnson. Um, who comes to me by way of a text, uh, an actual journal, other countries. Um, Brad Johnson is a black gay man who dies of uh, AIDS um, complications in Philadelphia, where I live have, have, and have lived for 13 years. And the text on subjugation prompts a deeper dive into his archive, where I actually come upon what his interest was in relationship to uh, bicameralism which is thinking about uh, the brain as something that's too chambered that speaks to itself or prompts like this kind of splitting of a self, a, a command or demand to do something and an answer within that. Julian was also one of his uh, professors at um, Yale. The first work that I make in response to thinking about um, a lot of the things that come out of Brad Johnson's archive is a work that figures myself within an identity, um, you know, much like the ones that I, mentioned today, not to be isolated, but to think about what the presentation of a full self means. That's my goal within my work, is to deal with the intersections of all of my identities. Um, the one that I focused on here is my relationship to the BDSM community. The piece that I'm gonna show you now just gives you a view of some of the work that comes out of that um, investigation. This one doesn't really have sound. Um, there's a piece that I make also called Dom Drop, thinking about 
I think in, even to try to bring it to what this panel is trying to maybe assess in regards to trans, I'm more interested, <clears throat> especially with Brad, is thinking about the splitting of the self. Is it possible to dom oneself? Is it possible to enact something um, where you can find a desire for, or a fetish, or a, um, and, and reach to the point of like a pleasure or ecstasy by enacting these things on yourself that removes you from the desire of another body or the requirement of another body. Uh, the project extends and takes on um, a deeper delve. In 2017, in August, I um, take a month where I go and take several archival pieces of Brad Johnson's work um, and ascribe them in a haptic investigation. Um, in thinking about ideas of trance, it's not something that I feel is, um, is something to be made articulate through certain kinds of language that are legible, but I am very much interested in uh, discussing and practicing a space of acknowledgement of haptics and how um, the, the, the space of in, uh, allowing one to feel and document feeling uh, can render a particular like advancement on work and the way that it's made. One of those acts uh, involved me suspending myself from my foot, feet, uh, while reading one of Brad Johnson's poem on subjugation. The way that it pre was presented, it was in, the, um, in a show called Speech Acts in uh, Institute of Contemporary Art Philadelphia. The work that's in the show here, um, The Labyrinth, comes from an actual original text called Leatherball. My, interest in the labyrinth is one that there is explicit language on the act of cruising. So I'm gonna talk about what my feeling about my work is in this, is to make very explicit this um, way of moving in terms of desire or towards a state of pleasure um, through a codified system uh, that is primarily practiced by gay men. So, um, after doing all that kind of investigation through the body, the then ultimate like output was to think about how I could bring in sculptural space and also documentation that's very similar to what my investigation was before into this kind of formal um, film, filmic uh, poetic essay. So in the case of the Labyrinth 1.0, the idea was to think about how could I extro like extract this consciousness of what quote unquote is Brad to bring him into two bodies, one that is masculine, one is like uh, that is feminine and vice versa in terms of like thinking about the systems of how one looks towards um, desire within a cruising space using cruising gestures. The other piece, in offering six years, a conjecture brings me back to this project here. So when I was asked to be a part of the um, New York show, I had already gotten a direct directive from my Baba um, during a reading um, where the Odu said that I needed to uh, do work with Shango based on a specific time in my life that was occurring last year where I was really, really worn out. Um, as a child of Ogun, I'm very much more laid back, I like to work. I like the process more than I probably like the exhibition of things. Um, but last year I had three back-to-back -back exi exhibitions in New York uh, that wore me the fuck out. <laughs> and um, in this reading, which happens for me about three to four times a year with my Baba, the thing that came up was like this idea of work for Shango. There's work that I immediately know that I need to do that are ebos or offerings that are very private and very much related to my own path within the practice. Um, but I wanted to complicate the idea of work and think about what it would mean to do a physical work and bring that work closer within my practice of filmmaking, object making, et cetera. So at the time as well, after Yasomi, who's here, um, who's my curator for the New York section, uh, invited me to think about Hubert Fichte. I looked up what he had written and the one text that caught my eye, of course, was Shango. I was like, okay, I'm gonna look at this. The trouble, though, is I ordered three copies, only one arrived. 
um, and it was not on the docket to be translated. So the way that I read this text was through a app on my phone um, called iTranslate, which is a very slow process. Um, and a couple of the pieces that are within this um, installation in its form are the pieces that are on the back wall uh, where I've scanned um, some texts that actually relate to uh, the Shango, um, uh, the deity as I understand it to be outside of this, um, what I would call, dare I say, Hubert Fichte is a very, very good ear hustler. Um, you know, like pillow talk, you know? Um, there's some things that are in there that are not exactly in relationship to Shango, but I think it also sums up uh, and is a very, very good example of his desire to fuck a god, right? The idea of thinking very much about Shango is the epitome of that man, that big man, beautiful man, as you mentioned before around Oshun. Shango is known in opposition to Ogun as someone who's more forward. Um, in the States, we say maybe he's like more of a Rico Suave type, like, you know. Um, and so the culmination of what I was able to gather was this like kind of adoration, but it made sense why this becomes a text that's definitive, definitive around this particular Arisha. Um, the work, uh, the camera starts rolling for me because I think um, I decided to document myself for the first time uh, at a crucial moment. My year, uh, starting last summer when I was away at a residency by the name of Skowhegan in Maine um, in the States, um, put me in a place where I also was coming up on my sixth uh, ultra birthday. Um, Shango's number within my practice is known as six uh, and also sometimes known as four. Shango's also known to know, have the head of many artists. It's something that you would definitely put petition to for good business, et cetera, a lot of different things. And so this particular um, ultra birthday is one uh, where I prepare um, uh, offerings for my egun or my ancestors, uh, as well as like doing something very specific to ask Shango to enter into this work. And so the video um, that is presented is actually documenting that day, which is my ultra birthday, um, which I also had to throw um, cowrie to ask per permission for this kind of a level of documentation. Um, this starts as a work, and I'm gonna show what the presentation in New York was at Participant, um, that allows me to kind of disclose again, research in relationship to something that is um, often brought up within this like ethnographic um, study of how complicated you can, or how close you can be um, uh, in looking at something. In this case, there still is a practice even at seven years old, I'm a baby. Um, comparison to, you know, my Baba comparison to many others who have many years, many decades um, uh, with, um, you know, their Arisha and that relationship and that learning. So it's an ongoing learning sp process that's almost like an autoethnography um, that I'm still in very much. And in this case, I decided to put that kind of a framework uh, towards thinking about um, uh, Shango uh, and how he's represented in uh, text by Pierre Roger and Roger Bastide as well as like how he's represented within um, uh, Shango. The piece that I'm really gonna kind of breeze through a little bit here is I prayed to the wrong God for you, um, which follows after this original offering to Shango to see if I can quote unquote do this work, um, which actually follows me uh, at following that uh, presentation um, in July, uh, moving into August, um, the actual work that I make and I decide to uh, make Shango's tools. And so that starts with the um, cutting down of a tree, uh, a cedar fir tree. Um, Shango's tools are made out of cedar for the red tinge, um, as his colors are uh, red and white. Um, and so I wanted a cedar fir tree because I wanted a tree that had been infiltrated by a certain kind of American landscape to kind of render it in this mutt format um, to kind of make a commentary on my place uh, as an African American in that country. Um, the I take the wood through a various different, like a different range of processes that I'm not gonna get into deeply here um, to just give you visuals of what that is. I'd also take these um, pieces of wood as well as some pieces of iron that I've cleaned um, and around the entire American landscape. So this starts in Maine, um, happens, some things happen in Philadelphia. Right now here I'm in a burnt out forest um, in uh, uh, Oregon. The tools are extracted from the pieces of the wood. Um, I re refurbished the 18th century horse bridle because Shango's um, animal is a horse. Uh, my mother lays um, uh, red underneath 
uh, a carrying device that I use to carry the tools. Um, I take them back to Havana, Cuba. And then I take them to Oyo State um, after another uh, reading with my um, Baba to one of the oldest uh, shrines um, in uh, Ibadan, Nigeria. was presented in a six-channel installation in the Whitney Biennial um, that just uh, wrapped in um, New York at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, the actual sculptural dynamic of the installation was something that is, was something that I've been working towards for my entire career, but in particular with this project was my interest in trying to figure out how to show things, but to also have this like strong denial. So the way that you have to view it is to walk around, and which causes you to basically miss a lot of the um, other um, channels that are in conversation with each other. Uh, the bottom channels document that earlier part of the process of curing the wood, and then underneath that, within a recessed vitrine, it has these objects, the actual tools that I carve, uh, the witness, the helmet that I carry around to kind of watch me while I enact these kind of ritualistic um, gestures towards this wood for Shango, as well as the um, iron that I um, clean and fashion uh, and repurpose. And um, this is the last presentation of uh, the tools, and the tools are made across all these places. They're made in Cuba because I was interested in making um, a, a, a diasporic object, something that did not just have a certain kind of ground uh, framework within an American context to disrupt um, and to make very explicit how these objects in a way function as my, la my land, as someone who is a New World practitioner, um, who's also part of this larger diasporic uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, uh, Nina, Ailson, Amilcar. Uh, I think all your experiences in your processes were, were very different and not limited to 
rereading uh, the text by Uber Fichte, but much stronger in, in the local and personal experiences and processes, as Tiona just mentioned, this almost auto ethnography. And I think we also arrived to a humorous limit where how could Fichte enjoy trance if he loves so much to take these ethnographic notes to describe the kind of salami as we watch in the film that was not Hungarian salami, if uh, he would think would be afraid that he would uh, uh, lose the consciousness. So how could uh, he report about his experience on trans? So maybe he was, uh, he, this was one of the limits uh, he was facing and, and could not uh, approach his own um, uh, crisis of uh, perception and of uh, capturing uh, realities and uh, other, uh, for him, other cultures. So Amilcar would uh, say is, uh, could be an uh, experience that leads you to the crisis of the modern autonomous subject. Uh, for Ireson, it's a way to approach it through metaphor because it's not meant to be revealed, this experience. For Nina, it uh, was not uh, a loss of consciousness, but much more a collective energy that flows through your body in connection with the members of the Candomblé. And Tiona also referred that for her it's much more interesting to see these possibilities of splitting of uh, uh, identity games and, and, and changes. And uh, I would like also to, to, to open the, the floor for you because we have a few minutes. We privilege the, the very rich presentations of all of you. So it's a microphone and uh, here is a question. Hi, thank you. In two parts, um, what did Hubert discover in his study and experience of Candomblé, which made him shift his analysis into one of the religion being an act of resistance? And part two, what in Candomblé, its practices and its specifically its trance aspects, it, its uh, communal aspects, its way of looking at the individual, um, or, and in relation to the collectivity can be effective for today's anti-imperialist uh, struggles uh, as well as inspire some kind of post-imperial, post-capitalist society for any one of you. I practice Santeria, but I want to just like warn against the idea that the, the, the religion can be used as a tool uh, against an imperialistic society uh, in this general um, way. Like I know I'm going to speak for myself as a priestess of Santeria, we do not proselytize. So there's not a situation where there's an idea to convince uh, people to like become a part of it because it is such an, a personal investment. Um, there is very much a communal process. Ours differs very much from um, Condomble, because I do know like when I was in um, Bahia for a month at the end of my year as a Yawo, which was my um, time where I was in all white for a year and seven days, the, I, the, seeing the tejeros and seeing how people live together and the, the consistent and communal care of that space differs from um, Santeria, where you do have uh, uh, happenings and occurrences where you come together um, and uh, in ceremony, in worship, et cetera. Um, but there's something that, you know, I, I specifically, it, fl it flags something for me around the use of it uh, to um, go against this idea of like capitalism, this and another, because there's a different kind of like um, uh, systems of structure of sustainability that exists within the, um, the, the way that I know my practice has made its way to me. So we're in the, you know, we're in 2019 in the States, there's a, a reconciliation, like not even a reconciliation, a recognition of this being the 400th year of, um, you know, since the first uh, uh, enslaved Africans have met, you know, uh, came to America or brought to America. And so this 400 year conversation, um, thinking about, if I think about myself on the other side of that, I'm someone who has received something, the only person in my family, this thing was able to survive through these certain kind of systems of sustainability, syncretism, et cetera. 
um, that are at its function um, and ha have challenged our ideas around like, um, I think sustainability as it's evolved as well. I, war where I am very wary of it being used as particular uh, type of tool to deal with um, you know, imperialistic structures or colonial structures even um, to like kind of save everyone. I don't believe it is to save everyone. I think it is only um, to, um, if people are doing a certain work to kind of deal with the self first, which is usually the problem. Uh, people want to jump to this group conversation without dealing with the self. Uh, so to, to heal the self, to deal with the self, to also deal with repair of self in the position of the bloodline, whether that be your ancestors as these oppressors or people who have been oppressed, to have that healing go and then to come together after once you've um, dedicated to that kind of like structure and restructure so that you can be just better people. Uh, an important thing that uh, Fichte faced an important thing that Fichte faced is that he went up to Candomblé in Bahia. He never considered himself an anthropologist and never wanted to be an ethnographer of that. But he faced a very serious problem, which was that he couldn't enter the secrets of Candomblé. So initially, that was a very complex issue. And then he managed, in a way, through other means, to get over that. And in an invasive manner, he managed to to do that which the European imaginary consecrated as a bloodbath or a banho de sangue, which is an initiation uh, process. He had contact with that, being warned by several intellectuals, including Verger, that he could only advance if he were initiated. So he was critiquing the position of the anthropologist who is outside and is almost always white and European and thinking about a culture of a different world, of the other side of the world across the Atlantic. But he also wanted to face these things and to overcome certain problems. So that's what makes his presence and relationship with the religion and sexuality very complex in America. There is a question in the middle <laughs> by Dulce. Hello, uh, thank you very much for a fascinating panel. Um, I just wanted to pick up on um, this jump that Amika made uh, from trance to translation and also to think about the break and to ask what happens when these kinds of practices move into the gallery space. Um, it was really interesting, Nina, to hear you talk about Candomblé in a very different space uh, in Germany um, that's not a tropical country. And I would be curious to hear, particularly from the artists, um, what, how you... Um, go about that translation, or if you see it as a translation of um, practice into a space, uh, the art space, which has its own set of rules and its own way of trying to determine a particular type of consciousness. Um, so yeah, I hope that's clear. And Amil Carr is a curator as well, if you'd like to answer. Okay, okay. So it's, it's not new. Uh, the, the objects, most of the objects that are in uh, museums, African objects, have uh, basically been stripped from their uh, religious ties. There's a larger conversation that's happening right now that I, I think a lot of people know about restitution, um, even repatriation of objects, et cetera. My project deals with that extensively 
one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to show people the work. This is what it takes to make these things, right? Um, this is, there's a moment even within uh, the, the piece that I have um, when I'm in Havana and my, ba my baba, um, uh, we make an ebo of rooster too. The tools, it's shown. This is what it takes. They're on in this sense, like what we say, they're on, they're active. Um, so for me, it's a chance to, do, to, again, to deal with repair or to make a statement um, around what actually is cut off um, and rendered just like from the collection of said white person, boom, 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 from 1925, you know. Um, there's a great film uh, that I have a project that I'm kind of like doing, a, it's like this extended critique, it's like, you know, it's the Chris Marker film, Statues Also Die, that talks about the evolution of how these um, objects come into those spaces. So. For me, it's a chance to enter into a certain kind of like engagement or um, uh, uh, accountability um, or qu question what are the limitations of these museum spaces. My work showed in the Whitney Biennial. Um, I am not exactly uh, in America, it's not any better for me <laughs> uh, in regards to my spiritual practice, right? Like there's people who look at me in a very hostile way. There's people within my practice that look at me in a hostile way because I'm also queer. Um, in the States, uh, there are folks um, in other countries that look at me in a hostile way where this um, religion exists as well for those other reasons, as, you know. Um, this project and the way that I decided that it would be the thing that I do because it, the thing that I did because it was where my life was, had a very much to do with um, challenging the productivity of how art is made. For me, it was very important to think about my life first at that time, and this is the project that felt the best to make for my life. It's not the work that um, brought the attention of the um, curators to my studio or that they would even want to include in that show. Um, so it was a very hostile work. The work won the top prize for the Whitney Biennial. Um, and that was really a big deal in relationship to this kind of work and how it can serve as a certain kind of commentary on where this stands again now within the American um, uh, framework. Because that shrine that I went to, uh, the objects that are there are the ones that have been uh, remade because the original objects are in the Detroit Institute of Art, right? They've been stolen, you know? So it's like, I think the um, question may be about uh, what are we thinking about those objects as? You know, are they still these kind of like, you know, objects and what is the repair models for knowledge? Um, and who is the person who's able to de de deliver a particular kind of knowledge? Uh, that isn't something that is completely coming from a scientific uh, standpoint, but more a lived experience. É, é, a, minha, a minha avó de, de santo. My, um, Avó de Santo, my uh, saint grand grandmother, he taught me that Candomblé was a lot more than religion, and especially an art, because the divinities, they dance, they have a very sophisticated uh, cuisine, there are the extremely elaborate outfits, and music is also so important. So it's a whole universe which is very aesthetic. But it's a different art from the Western concept of art. And she also mentioned that in this art, there was also a space where you could share with your friends, which is exactly at your threshold, at your house, where you host your friends. Another part of the house would be private, the part of the secret of the foundation of religion. So I have been working with the idea of art within this perspective. First, I am, I am not an ethnographer. I understand that ethnography, to me, it didn't really say anything because I come from within the house. So I don't need that. And the approach that I take of this universe is much more mythological based on the myths and the literature that built around it, the, the, the senses, and also be, being very respectful of fusing and developing a kind of mystical activism because the world does need religiosity. 
it does need faith and ashe. So the idea is to share other possibilities of relating to our problems, to our lives, and especially to look for alternative to heal our historical wounds, which are especially very specific when we talk about the history of colonialism and black slavery in the world. Thank you. Um, in the previous days, uh, I also did uh, a performance in the context of the opening of love and ethnology. And uh, we have been talking how for the uh, survival and resistance of Candomblé, purity had not been a requirement for this culture and this practice to continue to, to be uh, alive. And uh, since you are here today with us, I think it's interesting to see the meaning of, of certain elements. Uh, Ayrson text in the catalog, I invite you to read. He uh, somehow criticized the view of Fichte on the blood of Bas uh, for considering this uh, very catchy sensationalist um, a, a ritual. And, uh, but it's a meaning of the blood, the meaning of life uh, and uh, uh, other associations than uh, aesthetic uh, drama, and uh, I would like to, to invite Ayrson to shortly uh, close the panel because we have to, to continue with the program and uh, to contextualize the, the performance that, that you did uh, in the, uh, here in the early days. With popcorn. Yeah, with the popcorn. Okay. Popcorn in Yoruba language. Popcorn in Yoruba language means Buruburu means popcorn. Sorry, I got Portuguese and English mixed up, he says. Buruburu means pipoca, popcorn in Yoruba. And there is the black god Omolu that she showed. Omolu is dressed in straw to hide his wounds. He is sick. He is the god of sickness, but also of healing. And he dressed up in straw. His brother, Oshosi, dressed him up. He was the brother of Ogum and Oshosi. And then he was dressed in straw to be able to have a social life. In one of the beautiful legends, his mother is Nana, which is the primordial mud, the primordial mud, the deity, which gives then a shape to human beings. But then when she saw her son full of, uh, of uh, rashes abandoned him in the sea and another goddess cleaned him. That's why in Candomblé the bath is so important to cleanse the body, to wash off the disease. Uh, the bath is fundamental for us in Candomblé. And then he was cured. But he was still poor. And this deity from the sea, Yamanja, gave him a beautiful black pearl. That's why he is the lord of the black pearl, the lord of pearls, Omolu, which is the most precious gift from Yamanja. And there is there are so many myths. Each deity has uh, several myths. It's a very complex Shango. Um, and God, it's something else, Sobo, Shango, there's several denominations in Pernambuco. There's different names. This comes from Nigeria, and they all live together. In another myth, Yansa, which is the god of the wind and storms, blows and then removes the straws of Omolo, revealing a black prince. Beautiful, but full of wounds. And from each wound, from each skin disease, skin rash explodes a white flower, which is popcorn. So popcorn is the flower of Omolu. That's why it's so important for the cleansing rituals for the body, to remove disease of the body and to make the body healthy, to heal. So in Bahia, every Monday is the day of Omolu, and people do have a bath of popcorn to remove their wounds.
Yeah, I bet you.